as I am the last speaker, I just want to kind of reflect on the other speakers today. Um, it's been just a joy to kind of wake up in New York and start watching these talks. Um, and I just want to share some things that I wrote down um, from some of the speakers who spoke previously. Um, first was international magic. And I love this phrase, shift out thinking to the long term. Um, and then Ye Wan Song, her, her discussion about bringing back content awareness. Um, I just love this idea so much. Trom, push yourself into an unknown. Um, Tim Rodenbrock, I don't know if I say this name right, Rodenbrock, uh, Rodenbrocker, um, really focusing on the why, thinking about the why and uh, questioning how design applications work. Uh, AATV, you know, what do robots do when they're not producing? How, the, how can they become performers? And even this notion of eating and digesting um, and can we have a more quirky and funny future? And uh, RNDR focusing on kind of small iterations living next to each other and just the celebration of drawing. I just wanted to kind of reflect how um, great the talks have been. And that always makes me very nervous to be the last speaker. So, um, all right, let's get started. I'm gonna share my screen. Let me make sure I'm sharing computer audio. Um, boom. Okay. So I'm hearing some audio. I don't know if maybe somebody, somebody needs to mute. Um, cool. Um, so qu quick introduction to myself. My name is Zach Lieberman um, and talk is around poetic computation. I used to look like this. Um, I studied painting, printmaking, spent all of my time in the, in the um, printmaking studio. Um, and uh, for me, it was um, kind of like very accidental that I started working with computers. So I discovered uh, a tool called Flash. And usually when I'm giving a talk in the audience, I ask people like, oh, do you remember this? And I always see hands and heads nodding. Um, but for me, this was an amazing moment to discover that you could write a line of code to make something move. And this was a tool I had always loved animation. This was a tool that kind of opened up a, a doors for me. Um, and I want to, I'll jump in to talk about kind of some different projects, but this is, these are just to give you an introduction to my practice. This is a project called the iWriter that I worked on a while ago um, with a group of friends and we collaborated with Tempt. Tempt is a old school graffiti artist and he's completely paralyzed and we built a eye tracking device that uses his eye movement and allows him to draw graffiti kind of just with the movement of his eyes. Um, this is a project that I did with Toyota. Toyota has these small cars called the IQ. People think you can't drive them quickly. So we put colored dots on the top of it and hired a stunt driver to drive letters of the alphabet. And we made a font completely out of driving. A lot of my work involves the body. This is an interactive work that we did in New Zealand um, where we took your, your body, your um, contour, and turned you into a kind of monster um, three or four stories high. Um, oftentimes, I find myself doing extremely random things. This is my friend Daito Manabe, and we're hanging out in a hotel in, um, in Belgrade, kind of hacking on things. And this is using the movement of his face and creating objects that kind of are generated, but also bounce and respond to the physics and the, the objects on his face. And this is an early work um, that I created with Golan Levin, who was my teacher, and then we started collaborating. And this is a project called Manual Input Sessions, and it takes an overhead projector, so the kind of projector that your math professor would write notes on, and a digital projector and combines them to create a kind of hybrid light source, mixing both analog and digital light. So this is an audio-visual instrument. also a teacher so I have taught for about 10 years at Parsons which is a design school in New York and about seven years ago some friends and I got tired of the university world and we decided to create our own school it's called the School for Poetic Computation. Yewan was a student and she spoke about it earlier. Um, I'm also now I'm back in the university world I'm now a professor at MIT Media Lab so I kind of go back and forth between these two worlds I teach I help run the school in New York and I also teach at the Media Lab in, uh, in Cambridge. 
In terms of the School for Poetic Computation, we're really interested in focusing on poetry. Um, and in particular, when you describe this kind of work, people think of what you do, you would say kind of creative coder, but is there a way we can celebrate poetry, the, the act of writing poetry? And poetry is something really beautiful. Um, in the tech world, there's this concept of kind of making a demo um, or de demo or die, but the word demo very easily becomes the word poem if you rearrange the letters. And we were really interested in this notion of poetry with making poetry with technology. When you go to the bookstore, you always have to go to the back of the bookstore to find the poetry section. You know, nobody's getting rich writing poems, but it's the place where people are trying to use the right words and the right order to express what it means to be human and to be alive. Um, and I try to write these poems oftentimes through movement. So I'm posting kind of short sketches. I kind of create tiny poems and, and through animation. Um, and there are, um, they're just kind of small, small expressions where I work on an idea and, uh, you know, oftentimes I'll take a graphical form like a blob or some sort of shape and say, what happens if I extrude it, revolve it, rotate it, et cetera. Um, at when I was earlier, um, when all the Charlie Brown stuff was being shown, I was remembering these sketches that I made where I was kind of playing with, uh, Charlie Brown material. Um, oftentimes they involve the body in different ways. So using using my hand as input, using my face, using the body, um, and playing with typography. So I, I'm like a, always really frustrated when I go to the computer, I never know what font to choose. So I thought what would happen if I load all of my fonts? Um, and it's actually quite beautiful. If you see all of the fonts on your hard drive, you can see all of these tiny choices that designers have made, just like tens of thousands of little aesthetic choices. And I love type because it's so kind of fiddly and I think code is the same way. Um, and if you can really see like all of these aesthetic decisions from letter form to letter form. Um, I'm gonna talk about a few different kind of areas of interest. So in particular, I also love drawing, kind of um, reflecting what Edwin said. Uh, I, here's a few um, projects. This is a project called Inkspace. This is a, a drawing tool that uses the accelerometer of your phone. So your phone has this sensor which tells like how tilted it is. This is so you can know if you picked up your phone, if you're holding it next to your, to your face. Um, but this is using the accelerometer. So you make a drawing and then the drawing rotates in 3D. So just using the movement of the phone, just the simple movement kind of left, right, up, down, you can rotate the drawing and take what would be a two dimensional drawing and turn it into a kind of 3D form. And what I love about building tools is seeing the creative things that people do with it. So here is just the kind of scribbles, oftentimes very childish things that people make with it. Um, I really love this sort of thing. So somebody, um, and then this drawing, um, this, this woman made from South Korea of this bird, and I love it so much. I can't imagine how she made it. And one of the joys about making tools is seeing the things that people do with them. Uh, another project that involves drawing is called Landlines, and this I made in collaboration with Google. Google has all of these satellite photographs from around the world. So we're trying to find a, a kind of interesting way of um, connecting to them. So this is a drawing interface where you draw a line, you draw a curve, and it matches that curve somewhere in the world. So if you draw um, you know, an angle, it'll find an angle. If you draw a straight line, it'll draw a straight line. If you draw um, yeah, a, a triangle or a rectangle, it'll find a rectangle. Um, and these kinds of projects, they have a very beautiful front end, but a lot of the work that I do on a daily basis involves data. Um, there's a kind of back end where you're sifting through data and trying to figure out you know, how to do the matching and um, how to work with kind of large data sets. Uh, second part of this project connects the dominant line. So it finds coastline and highways and rivers and just the, what is the most dominant line in an image. And as you, with your finger, as you're dragging, it's stitching together photographs from around the world to make a kind of infinite landscape. And these are real places. You can click on the link and go to the map and explore further if you want to. I'm also really interested in the body and using the body as a kind of input source and really inspired by um, the uh, Oscar Schlemmer and these um, Bauhaus costumes. And these are just incredible, kind of taking the body as a starting point and seeing kind of different forms of abstraction. Uh, Louis uh, Bourgeois is an artist taking the body as a, um, as, a, as a starting point for abstract form, Nick Cave sound suits. These kind of work really inspired me to you know, take the body um, as inputs and figure out kind of from a graphical perspective, what kind of graphical forms can we use that come from and emanate from the body and how can we transform the human form 
And how do we, is it still legible? Can we still read it, right? If we extrude, revolve, attach things to the body, how legible is it? Um, and I, a lot of my work plays with the kind of area of legibility. If something's kind of legible or not legible, and I want to kind of hang out in that space. Um, and this is a project that I did with New York Times, uh, a visual journey through addiction. This is attempting to visualize opioid addiction. And so for this article, the authors of the article interviewed hundreds of addicts who had taken opioids, the, the drug, about what their body feels like in the different stages. And then we commissioned a dancer to actually dance these, the quotes, to interpret the language from these addicts and dance what, the, what these quotes were saying. Um, and then I wrote software that takes the, the body as input and tracks the movement and tries to figure out a kind of way using the language, using the words from these former addicts um, to describe what, what addiction feels like. So this is an article where you can read about these stages of addiction, but then also as you scroll, you can see visual forms that are created from dance, that are created from interpreting what these participants said about what their body feels like. So this is um, withdrawal, um, when you stop taking the drug. This is addiction, when you have to keep taking the drug in order to maintain a baseline. This is treatment, when you start taking medication in order to combat the addiction. This is relapse. And this is um, recovery. And for me, it's really exciting. I do a lot of stuff in motion. And one of the joys was like opening up the New York Times and seeing this artwork in a two, two, two page spread. And it was like made my mom really proud. I ran around Brooklyn trying to buy every copy of the New York Times. Um, also really interested in space. And in my studio, my partner Momo and I have been doing experiments around AR and, um, and kind of augmented reality as a way of understanding and exploring space. So when Apple released ARKit, I saw a lot of demos where people were taking um, the, their devices and putting 3D objects in the air. Um, and I thought they were so boring. I thought it was incredibly boring to be putting 3D geometry. So we started with very simple experiments where we said, you know, what if we just say, what does it mean to have a camera in the air? So taking photographs and having the photograph stay in the, in the um, place where you took it. And then you wind up with these kind of fragmentary images. And so what does it mean to have a camera and a screen and a microphone and a speaker in 3D? We can start to ask fundamental questions about what is a camera. Um, this is taking frames of video and having those frames of video stay in the air. So you can see um, the, the video sort of floating there and you can walk through it and with your body scrub and play back the, the video. So using your physical movement as a kind of playhead to move through video. This is taking photographs and breaking them into pieces. So as you move around, there's one vantage point where the, where the image looks correct. But as you move, the image starts to break and turn into a kind of fragmentary image. Um, this is a slit scan. So this is grabbing pixels that are in front of you and allowing you to paint with the color that's in the world, but in 3D. So grabbing the material of the world and using that as a kind of paintbrush. Um, again, images that look correct from one vantage point, but then as you move, they start to warp. And this is the kind of stuff which I, these sorts of images, which I really love. Um, and I think AR is an incredible vehicle for ambiguity, for creating images and scenarios that are hard for your brain to understand. And for me, that, th that's really interesting. Um, this is recording audio in space. And then when you move, you can replay the audio. This is a test of talking and seeing what happens when we record audio in space. Um, we've also been working with typography, so we made an app called Weird Type, where you can um, write messages and then draw with them in the air. So you're kind of creating, creating words and putting them in 3D. Um, and 
um, it's been really exciting when, again, when you make tools, seeing the sorts of things that people do with them. So um, somebody figured out if you take the letter O, you can drag it and then make a tunnel and then run through the tunnel. And that's something that I, I didn't know you could do. It was really exciting. Um, and it's been really fun to see kind of how people use it, where they use it. Um, this is yes, made out of the word yes. Um, this is the Houston, the draw with the letters and then run through them. This is one of my favorites. It's very subtle, but there's a photo mode. So here's somebody's typing R L R L. So they're making a kind of slalom run and then they say, ready, set, go. And then they run through the letters. So they've written the letters in the air and then they run through them almost like how you would ski through a slalom course. Um, we've also made an app called Weird Cuts. So this allows you to take photographs of the world, cut pieces of the world, and then um, paint with them in the air. So doing a kind of a form of collage um, in, in AR. Uh, and it's been, we've been using it in the studio and having a lot of fun with it, kind of creating weird faces and, you know, kind of playing with, uh, with face body parts and putting them in, in space. Um, somebody made this incredible sandwich. So this is taking the Weird Cuts app and made a 3D sandwich. And I just love when you put things out in the world, seeing what people do with them. Um, we've been doing a lot of experiments with the body, taking the body as a um, starting point and seeing what, how can we put it in the air. Um, these sorts of things like painting uh, trails of your body in space, um, recording, looping the body. Um, and a lot of what we're doing, it's not really making art, but it's trying to find a grammar in a way, a kind of, yeah, a grammar of AR. Uh, and I think that as a creator that you think about your work as kind of creating a grammar or a language, then the creativity comes from the application of that grammar. So here's kind of creating trails with your hands. And then we say, okay, what if those trails were thick and what would they look like? Or could you actually paint with the color of your body. So as you move, you're sort of painting in the air. What, what does that feel like? And if you're moving, what happens if we run through it? You know, and we kind of follow as you're moving and you're drawing a tube, you know, what, what would that feel like? Um, and then we do things like hide your body. So you think about AR as kind of augmenting, adding a layer onto the world. Could we also hide people um, and use AR as a form of um, masking and hiding people? Um, doing a lot of kind of face filters and just crazy experiments with, uh, and seeing how we can take the world and explore it. The last thing I want to say is that I teach, and one of the things that I love to teach at the School for Poetic Computation is a class that's about the past. And it's really inspired by this book, Asama Satu, The Art of Computer Designing. And it's this incredible book from the 90s. And at the end of the book, he's thanking people and he's saying, okay, I would love to thank the Bauhaus whose typefaces and designs have inspired my work. And he said, if those artists were alive today to work with computers, I'm, I'm certain they would discover new artistic possibilities. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. And I think this sentence is really powerful. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. And with my students, I teach a class where we recreate work from the past. Um, I think it really resonated. I think Trom said something about the past being very powerful, that actually look to the past, that those images that come forward from the past are really strong. And I think it's the same thing, that designers and messages from the past, we can, we can understand them and unpack them. So for example, Muriel Cooper, who is, uh, helped start the MIT Media Lab, was the design director at MIT Press, the work of her visual language workshop group you know, that work is so beautiful. It's early days of exploring typography in 3D. And when Tim was showing his lifeline animation, I thought immediately of this work, um, you know, this kind of putting type in space and what does it feel like to be moving and navigating through type. So my students study her work and then recreate it for homework. Or um, Vera Molnar, who's a Hungarian artist for, based in Paris, who's been doing pen plotter drawings my students study her work and then recreate her work using modern tools as a way of having a conversation with history. And we were invited to show our work at a festival. And usually when you see artwork that's created with code, you see um, code, you only see the output. You never see the actual code. You just see the end result. But we wanted to celebrate the code. So we suggested putting the code and the visual side by side so you could see both. Um, and when we got there, all of our equipment said poetic on it. 
Um, and the way this installation worked is that you had text on one side and visuals on the other. And for this one, this was non-interactive. The students were kind of had recorded themselves, but later we made it interactive so that you could actually manipulate the code and see corresponding changes in the visual form. Um, but here you could see when some variable in the code would change, you see a corresponding change in the visual. So seeing both text and image side by side. We also made zines. So the idea is that you would go, you, what you were seeing on these screens were homeworks that students made, but the zine was there to help you learn about these artists. Every, every animation would start, it sounded like somebody was typing, and then you would see the kind of visual form on the left side. Um, and there were dozens and dozens of sketches that my students made. And this inspired me so much that I started my own process of daily sketching. So this is a kind of um, inspiration for me to be posting sketches, which I've been doing for over four years now. Um, the last thing I want to say, and I, I'll, I'm going to wrap up and do Q&A, is just say I want to acknowledge like what a strange moment we're in. And I was walking my dog the other day, and I saw this like graffiti on the wall. Somebody had tagged the wall and wrote COVID-19. And it was like one of these things, like you feel like you're in a really bad science fiction movie or a video game, and it's like this environmental graffiti to tell you what's happening in the world. It made me feel just terrible. Um, and then I walked by it the other day and somebody had crossed it out and written the word hope. Um, and it, for me, this was like, just like very simple act. Um, but one of these things where I just felt like, um, yeah, hope, I, you know, I just really, um, I have a lot of hope that this situation will change, that this moment will change. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here with you now and really excited to be a part of this, um, this event. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. I think that was a perfect quote for the end. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thanks. I mean, we gathered some questions, of course, and um, let's jump into it. Um, one of those was maybe more to that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There, um, you were talking a little bit about um, how your tools uh, basically enable others to create things you couldn't even think of. And in a way, I think um, you invite people to play with their Im imagination and to explore a little bit their own creativity, I would say. So mm -hmm. how much do you still play and how much of your work is planned? Um, and I, mean, yeah. I mean, I play all the time, right? When I'm sketching and creating things, a lot of, the, when I said, I said coding is fiddly, like all of my work is adjusting numbers. Like all I'm doing, like I'm writing algorithms, but mostly I'm just like, like, adjusting 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 and it feels whenever i talk to type designers i feel like we do the same thing like we are like so you know these tiny things um and then what i build interactive work i want people to ex to have that same joy but oftentimes it's it may not be fun to fiddle with numbers but to use their body to understand right to use your movement or your gesture or things that you create to understand these computational systems so um, I'm try oftentimes when I build interactive work, what I try to do is take the joy of, of the things that I experience creating and sketching and put that in the form of an interaction. Yeah, and I think that an um, aspect of understanding that r digital realm, I think that's, that's also something really interesting you had um, with all the AR projects you did. I mean, basically you're kind of um, dissolving us as a body um, with the digital world and for someone who's maybe not technical, um, it is easier to understand what di the digital really means and you kind of can interact in it in a simple yeah. way. Yeah, and I also think, I mean, it's easy to dismiss things like face filters as being trivial or playful, you know, because, uh, you know, a lot of them are very, like, simple and childish. But I think it's really profound when you see people use filters. Sorry. <laughs> um, you'll see they do this thing where they turn away and then the software doesn't see a face anymore. You know, so the mask will disappear and then they look towards it and it pops up and then they look away and they look towards it. And that is playing with the border of legibility. That is playing with the threshold of, you know, does this, does this machine understand I'm a human? 
And I think that's really powerful. I think that's really important for people to be exploring that. It's like these weird moments. If you go to an automatic soap dispenser and you see like you put your hand out and it doesn't no soap comes, you know, and you're like, I'm a, I'm a human, right? And you're moving your hand and lifting it and lowering it. And I think that that, it, that space of recognizing if there's a person there is really powerful. Yeah, I mean, totally. Um, somehow uh, we wonder how you can get all of those things happening at the same time together, your school, your commercial work and your artic artistic practice. How yeah. do they influence each other and how do you keep up with all of them? Yeah, I mean, I always talk about, I didn't mention it in this talk, but like one third, one third, one third. And for me, this is the model that I think is really kind of like finding the right balance in your life which is one third of my time is, is working time is in teaching, one third making artwork, one third doing commercial work. And I try to be very, I'm not super religious about it. I'm not doing time tracking, but just being really conscious of how much time each of those things are taking. And then I think of these things as three legs of a stool that you can take things that you learn from the commercial world and bring it into the classroom. You can take um, things that you learn from art making and bring it to your commercial projects. And then with teaching, like I love talking to students, but also I feel like I'm a vampire and I want to get there. For them, it's like they're, it's so new, right? Writing code and seeing algorithms work. So I want to get that. I want to feel like what that feels like again. I want to feel like that this, you know, they're, they're having these small victories and small discoveries. And I want to take that energy and bring it to my art practice. So there's a kind of dialogue between all three of these things. Then in, in terms of balance, I think a lot of it is about decision making. And, you know, as you get older, you learn, you know, what, what to say yes to and what to say no to and what, you know, a lot of those things are kind of like they take, they take a lot of learning. Yeah, no, also it means I think that you have to know really what your aim is and uh, where you want to head to. I mean... Mm -hmm. That is probably the thing most people really struggle with, that um, they don't have a clear vision of uh, where they want to go. Um, but once you have that, I think it becomes more or easier, I guess. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so, I mean, yeah, in, in total, uh, we see that you create so much output. Um, and uh, we were just wondering, like, which projects uh, or ideas were the most impactful for you? And um, what events or people shaped you as an artist? Yeah, I mean, I would say um, the iWriter project for me was one of, I mentioned it, this was the project that we made with this graffiti artist. For me, that was a really profound project. And that just, you know, that was really the right people at the right time in the right place. And those sorts of things don't happen very often. That for me, that was, that was magic. Um, and then, you know, what, what helped for me is discovering, there have been certain moments where I've discovered, um, for example, the work of John Maida. So John Maida was a professor at the MIT Media Lab, and he wrote these amazing books. The um, Design by Numbers uh, w is, was one of these books. So I kept going, I knew, I was excited about computation, mm -hmm. but I didn't know, I would go to the bookstore and all of these computer books were terrible. You know, they were all like C++ in 21 days, J learn Java in seven days, you know, and they were all just like, how, 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 and, uh, and for me, it was really like fine. Maida was writing about why. And I just, yeah, Tim also mentioned that why, like that finding those books that wrote about code and computation in a poetic way, like that opened up doors for me, for sure. Cool. So what we also want to know is how much of, of the stuff you're posting, for instance, on, on Instagram are happy accidents or just like based on playing around with code? Yeah, I would say a lot of it. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I iterate. Sometimes I know where I want to go. Sometimes I have a kind of design inspiration or something I'm trying to do. Um, a lot of times it's a kind of um, a form of procrastination where it's like I'll take a break from <laughs> work and I'll be like, oh, I'll get back into a sketch. So, um, cool. And I just, I'm changing. A lot of times it looks like a lot of work, but, but the things that you see from day to day are those tiny iterations. Those, what Edwin was talking about, this kind of like, they are iterations and oftentimes I'm, I think a really interesting question to ask yourself is, what is the smallest change I can make to make something new? What is the tiniest thing I can do to make a new thing? And that's what I try to do through sketching. Cool, cool.
There was another question from Dan Manneswag. Um, he asked, uh, I sincerely love how you use the human exterior as a gesture. Have you been mm -hmm. working with the internal part as well? In uh, parenthesis, brainwave sensors, heartbeats, uh, sugar levels. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I've done some stuff with body, different types of body sensors. I have found a lot of them are not so immediate. So I really love using cameras and you know things like connects or different types of cameras because it's very low latency from you know you move and you you see your body and even if there's a few frames and there's some delay you still feel like I have a very direct connection with what I'm doing. And as soon as you use something like a brainwave meter, you know, it takes time. It takes time for that data to um you know to to be registered. And so I just, I haven't found great ways of doing that. One thing, um, yeah, I haven't found great ways of using that information, but I have done stuff with those sensors for sure. Okay, cool. Miriam wants to know, dear Zach, um, thank you for the talk and making amazing work. Would you like to tell something about your teaching at MIT and sure. how do you feel that students who grew up with computers see and move differently in the technology? Yeah, so I'm a professor now at MIT. It has been a crazy year, um, you know, where we start, MIT had a huge crisis in the fall, um, and then we uh, have ended with COVID, you know, ended the semester with COVID, but the, the Media Lab is full of the warmest and some of the warmest and smartest people that I know. Um, and a lot of them are, it's a, it's a science school, like MIT is a science school. And one of the things that is really interesting for me is trying to figure out a lot of times when I teach at SFPC, I'm teaching artists and designers and folks from a kind of artistic bent about how, do you, how to integrate technology into their practice. And the students that I'm working with at MIT are very technical and I'm teaching them about how to bring art into their practice. And it's, it's almost the same conversation, but in different directions and, um, and it's really beautiful. And one of my, um, one of, I think my job right now is to connect these worlds where you have the SFBC is this like tiny room and small number of people hanging, you know, and, and very like home, you know, we have no budget. We have, it's very tiny. Um, and MIT is this really, Media Lab's like this big behemoth, but I think there's a lot that we can learn from each other. So I feel like I'm trying to bridge these worlds in a way. Cool, thank you. So Zach, is there any message you want to, to um, yeah? Let the audience know, is there anything um, you, you I mean, one thing that I love to say that I always say to students um, and young people in particular is like the world is hungry for ideas. And when you go to a conference like this, sometimes, I mean, obviously you can get a lot of inspiration and see, you know, it's really nice to see people and see who they are. You see the work, but then to get a sense of who the person is and where they're coming from. But one thing I wanna say is that there's so much, we need new things in the world, right? We need new tools, we need new platforms, we need new schools, we need new, you know, we, we, need, a, we need a lot of everything. So don't be intimidated and, um, and that like, I think that's an important, really important message to be sharing with students is that there are, it, a lot of it depends on how you look at things, but when you look at things in the right way, there are all of these gaps. And a lot of it is about changing your perspective. So I would just say the, the world is hungry for ideas. <laughs> super, wow. super nice ending. Thank you very much for your time and your talk. It was really inspiring. Super nice to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me.